Thank you, Aaron. Well, hello and welcome. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I am Dr. Jeff Fox, and uh, on that slide there, that's actually the chair I'm sitting in with my office, but I'm not wearing a suit today. Uh, I want to thank Aaron and Heather. They've been great to work with. Uh, this is an exciting topic. It's a very important and timely topic, and it's great to see that so many people have done an assessment. I always try to teach toward the middle of the class, so uh, this isn't going to be at the high end, and it's not, not going to be at the very low end. It's going to be about in the middle, I hope. Hopefully you'll take some things away. I may, I may tell you some things you already know about. I'm sure there's some out there who know a lot more about this than I do, but maybe you'll put some things in your toolbox that, that can benefit you. And if, uh, if you want to talk and ask questions or make comments uh, beyond this, you have my information here, and my information is also available at the very end of the course as well. Uh, what I want to do, I want to thank you as well for being here today and taking time out of your busy schedule. But I want to go real quickly kind of through what we're going to talk about. First, we're going to have a general discussion about risk assessment. Then we're going to look at a couple of examples of uh, risk, risk models or programs that are out there. I'll be honest, I'm not going to get into those programs a lot because each one of those would probably take over an hour or maybe even a day to get into. So, so you may be familiar with them, maybe not. So um, I want to make you aware of them at least. Then I want to show you a couple of slides that actually show you some products of a, of a risk assessment. And then finally, we'll finish up with, uh, well, what do, what do we do next? Uh, what do you do after your risk assessment? Because that's just part of it, really. And then we'll take questions. Now, quite frankly, there are a lot of slides here, and we're going to go through some of them pretty quickly. But for those of you who are members, um, you'll actually be getting this presentation. And if you're not, if you'd like to get a copy of the presentation, you can just email me, and I'll be glad to send that to you. Well, let's start with a little bit of humor. Uh, first, uh, of course, we were aware of the risk. That is why we did a very careful analysis of who would get the blame. And uh, although that's a cartoon, unfortunately, that's all too true to life, isn't it? That uh, a lot of times that we're, we're just looking to see who's going to get the blame when something goes wrong. And, uh, and that's a shame. And, and it's going to happen one way or another. We, we live with risk every day of our lives. Uh, in the introduction, there's no one way to conduct a risk assessment. As you'll see, there's a lot of and there's all t uh, sorts of types of risk assessments to do. Probably one of the most important things I can tell you today is we should never, ever conduct a risk assessment in a vacuum. And uh, I'll, I'll actually expound upon that a little bit as we go, but that's one of those nuggets I would like for you to take with you is, is don't do it alone, because if you do, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be a complete risk assessment. Uh, there's many things that we assess, and, and you'll see some of this over and over again as we go through here. We, we might assess risk to people, or to places, or to things. It's, it's going to be one of those, people, places, or things. Today, our focus is going to be on places. Um, another fact of life is we can never totally el eliminate all risk. If I were asked to go to a, an amusement park, and the owner of that amusement park said, I would like for you to help me reduce my risk. Matter of fact, I'd like to get it down to zero. I would say, I can do that for you pretty easily. Lock your gates, shut everything down, and don't let anybody in. And I can almost guarantee you 100% aversion. aversion. Now, that's not quite right because there's still potential for somebody to get hurt. But then you have to look, well, how do they make money? How do people in there is eliminated? So we can't get rid of the risks we, we live with in life, but we can reduce them, we can mitigate them, and, and we can be aware of them. Always consider in the full context of emergency management and homeland security. Risk assessment really falls under mitigation, and I like to look at mitigation as part of prevention. Okay, before we mitigate, we need to assess, and a lot of times people will jump right into mitigation, which uh, is, is human nature. We want we want to be actionable. We want, we want to get involved and do something. Well, assessing the risk is part of that, and you're going to do much better on mitigation if you assess it to begin with. And of course, along with mitigation comes preparedness and response and recovery. All right, risk analysis and management. What is risk? And, and, and actually, like so many things in life, there's all sorts of definitions of risk. But I try to come up with the ones that are most germane to, to what we're talking about today. Risk is the likelihood of a threat or hazard occurring to an object, as I said a second ago, a person, place, or thing that is to be protected. And there's really two types. There's threats and their hazards, man-made, non-accidental, and accidental, and then natural. Pretty much everything we come across is going to fall into one of those categories. And honestly, um, 
more likely something that's going to cause us a problem is going to be uh, accidental. As much as it is non-accidental, something done on purpose, accidental or actually natural, if you will. Hazards can be natural or man-made and are generally unintentional. Uh, if somebody gets killed, if it was unintentional, they're still dead. If 10 people get hurt, it doesn't matter whether it was intentional or not, they're still dead. So we have to look at this uh, from an all-hazards perspective. Um, now, some people are going to tell you there's no difference between the two, and, and I can argue as well as semantics, but hazards, again, natural or man-made and are generally unintentional or without malice. Threats are always man-made and are intentional with malice. And again, people can argue that, and it depends on what area you're from, your background, as to what that means to you. But I really want to emphasize, again, and this is one of the things you put in your toolbox, please think all hazards all hazards, including all threats. I work with a lot of young students who are starting out and, and their focus always seems to be on terrorism. And honestly, terrorism is but one of the many, many hazards. I never want to downplay terrorism, but honestly, any given day we wake up, something else is going to bring us down more so than terrorism, and we need to be looking at all hazards. And again, uh, there's many variables. And think locally, think regionally, think state, country, and even globally. Uh, things that may happen in your jurisdiction could, could have cascading effects over into others, especially when we look at biological issues, look at the Zika, Zika, uh, Zika virus right now. Cascading effects sometimes aren't even things that we can even see, uh, uh, even if uh, cyber. Cyber has many cascading effects. Okay, well, why should we assess or manage risk? There are so many different reasons, and I'm going to go through these kind of quickly for safety for security, for protection, cost reduction in the long run, I'm going to go back to that one in a second, ethical, it's just the right thing to do, compliance for policy, for legal liability issues, accreditation issues, grants, morale, and yes, it even helps increase the speed of response and recovery if we've done a proper assessment and if we've mitigated. I want to go back and hit a couple of those real quickly. Cost reduction, sometimes we're explain why we need to spend money on something that hadn't happened. Well, it's either going to be pay me now or pay me later. And when we do a, a proper risk assessment, we can help show the need that to go ahead and pay me now. Let's get this fixed. Let's, let's get rid of this uh, uh, threat or risk or hazard or reduce it or mitigate it. Um, the uh, compliance one, legal liability, one of the worst things we can do is do an assessment and then turn around and then do nothing about it. We recognize, we write down that we have threats, we have hazards, but we do nothing to mitigate, mitigate it. So if we're going to do it, we need to carry it all the way through. Uh, for grants, if, if you want grants, you're pretty much going to have to do an assessment in order to get those grants, and rightfully so. Morale. You do an assessment, and at least your people are going to go, you know, they must care about us because they're looking at this. I've worked in offices where you can walk right into the building, and a, a shooter can walk right in and shoot the secretary. And for years, I, I would hear about that, and I had no power to do anything about that. And, uh, and that, that's, that's a killer to morale. It's just not how things should be. Okay, some of these slides we're going to go through pretty quickly. Some of them we're going to stop, park, get out, and kick the wheels a little bit. Hazard identification and risk assessment provides the factual basis for activities proposed in the strategy portion of the hazard mitigation plan. They go hand in hand. An effective risk assessment informs proposed actions uh, focusing attention and resources on the greatest risk. And that's what we're going to find out. What are our greatest risk? Okay. Well, how do we look at that? And, and there's a formula for that. But very simply, what's most likely to happen and what's the most damage that can happen? You may have one thing where it says most likely an empty building that you're going to tear down anyway could burn down. Well, is that really that damaging? Versus we have a small building over here that has 10 people in it and it's very susceptible to, to all sorts of hazards. So we have to figure out what are our greatest risks. We have to prioritize them. And that's really what this is all about, prioritizing the risk. And there's four basic components. And I'm going to show you quite a few different graphs and charts to help visualize that. And we'll go through this quickly. But let's talk about them here for a second. First, hazard identification. Next, profiling of hazard events. And then, inventory of assets. And then finally, estimation of potential human and economic losses based on the exposure and vulnerability of people, buildings, and infrastructure. 
So by now, you've probably started seeing a theme of certain words that are going to pop up over and over again. So a little more officially, according to the Department of Homeland Security Risk Lexicon Assessment 2010, risk is the potential for an unwanted outcome resulting from an incident, event, or occurrence as determined by its likelihood and the associated consequences. Additionally, risk is the potential for an adverse outcome assessed as a function of threats, vulnerabilities, and consequences associated with an incident, event, or occurrence. Very, very legally ease, very straightforward, and, and we've kind of talked about it a little bit. I like this slide. There's a, there's a lot on this slide. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I want you to look at this real quickly, if you will. There you see, and this is an all-encompassing, but it does have a, a good flavor of an all-hazards approach. There you see on the left are many of the hazards and threats, honestly. Fire, explosion, natural hazards, terrorism, workplace violence, utility outlets, supplier failure, cyber attack. I tell you, I'm not sure that I can wake up any given day and not hear about at least one of these happening somewhere around the country. And honestly, they're happening all over the country. They're going to happen every day. So that's hazard identification. So we have to look at the probability and the magnitude. Those are the hazards and the threats. And then we have to assess uh, assets at risk. Well, number one is always people. Then the building, supply chain, systems, reputation of, the, of your agency the environment, all sorts of things there. So vulnerability of assessment. So we have probability and management, a magnitude, and we have vulnerability. And then on the far right, we have in the red the impacts. Of course, casualties, which can involve death, property damage, financial loss, customer loss, lawsuits. Uh, so we have hazard identification, vulnerability assessment, and impact analysis. And then at the bottom, you'll see where it says threat. The likelihood of an attack occurring vulnerability but relative exposure to an attack, and then consequence for the expected impact of an attack. Now, this slide here in red are the words that you really want to focus on, DHS guidelines. The National Infrastructure Protection Plan, otherwise known as NIP, has appropriately stipulated the following four core criteria for reproducible, defensible and complete. And hopefully the information you get from here today will help you do that. Um, there, there's, there's protocols in place, there's procedures in place to, to help you do this when, when you do a, a, a write for a grant or you just do it for whatever reason you're doing it. But you have to have it documented, it's got to be reproducible, it's got to be defensible, and it's got to be complete. But it doesn't stop there. Similarly, the Office of Risk Management and Analysis has stated that DHS's integrated risk management should be flexible, interoperable, and transparent, and based on sound analysis. So it's got to be flexible, interoperable, transparent, and based on sound analysis. Make sure whenever you do one that you look at those eight phrases or words, and if you're doing those, you're in pretty good shape. That's what's going to be expected. Uh, most of you probably know what critical infrastructure is. Uh, just very quickly, I want to go through this. Critical infrastructure are physical and virtual components that are vital to the United States. They're deemed critical as their as they, their uh, compromise or breakdown would have a significant effect on the United States national security, public health, safety, and the economy. And I'm going to show you on the next slide what those are. Those are some pictures of some. But I, I, I'm kind of a rebel. I, I kind of like to think outside the box. I like to challenge things. And I want you to be a critical thinker. And um, you'll see on the next page what the critical infrastructure is. And, and it's exactly right as it ought to be. But there's so many other things that aren't listed in the critical infrastructure that we need to pay attention to. Uh, it does not have to be an official DS, a DHS CIKR or critical infrastructure in order for a risk assessment to be done. And I quite frankly would argue that there's a lot of things that aren't on that list that, that whoever Color is should have a risk assessment done. And I want to mention, as a lot of you probably already know, about 85% of our critical infrastructure is privately owned. So that, that puts a big onus on the, uh, on the private uh, companies to actually to comply and, and to make sure that we're, we're doing risk assessments and we're mitigating, uh, we're target hardening, we're making it harder uh, for our systems to go down. 
I don't know if that's an airplane in the background or what that was, but I hope you all didn't hear that noise. Uh, there's 18 sectors or sector-specific agencies. I'm not going to read through all of these, but on the right-hand side, you can see them real quickly. Agriculture, energy, water, banking, postal, government facilities. Uh, just take a second to look at that. Uh, but there's some I want you to think about that aren't on here. And I'm not suggesting that we add these to the critical infrastructure, but, but I always want to emphasize to my audience that just because your, your building or not on here doesn't mean that it's not worthy or in need of a risk assessment. I would argue churches should have risk assessments done for a lot of reasons. And it's not just terrorism, remember. It's just, it's just all hazards. Um, entertainment venues are not on here. Theaters and amusement parks. We just saw what happened down in Florida with an alligator uh, in the Midwest with a child being thrown off of the uh, ride. Uh, so amusement parks have a lot of risks. I kind of mentioned them at the beginning, but movie theaters, any sort of, uh, of uh, entertainment facility, I would argue should definitely have a risk assessment done. I would even say your home, and you know, for your home, you don't have to go through all this and sit down and interview each one of your kids and ask them a lot of questions, and but uh, or the pets or the dogs or the cats, but but your home should have a risk assessment done, and definitely businesses, private businesses, should have risk assessments done. Now, you could probably put schools, higher uh, higher ed, uh, K through 12, under government facilities, and that's probably where it would fit the best. But I would definitely argue every university, every college, every school should have a risk assessment done. And then there's many other places. I just want to mention those, that just because it's not on the list doesn't mean it's not worthy of, of having an assessment done. I like to visualize things and use analogies. So let's take a look at this uh, graph for a minute. The National Infra Infrastructure Protection Plan, NIP, describes processes to set goals and objectives to identify assets, systems, and net and assess risk. And there you see again, consequences, vulnerabilities, and threats. And prioritize, that's a big part of this. We only have so much time and so much money to apply to things. So we have to prioritize where we put that time and that money. And doing a risk assessment helps you do that. Implement protective programs and resiliency strategies. I love resiliency strategies. The healthier a company is, the quicker they're going to rebound. The healthier the employees are, the quicker they're going to rebound from a, from a disaster. And then we have to measure effectiveness. If you look on the aerial, cyber, and human, these are all three critical. And I'm really glad this is the way it is. Uh, fiscal, obviously, is the building. But cyber is something we just don't see. And well, I work with a lot of students. And when we do assessments uh, for practical exercises, if I don't say something about it, they'll, they'll skip right over cyber. Cyber is interconnected into everything. And when we get toward the end, actually, you could do a cyber assessment all by itself. But I would say your cyber should be part of any assessment you do, but then also human. And this is a never-ending cycle. And you'll see that on some of these other slides as well. You set goals and objectives. You identify assets, systems, and networks. You assess risks. There you see it again, consequences, vulnerabilities, and threats. Then you prioritize. You implement programs. You measure effectiveness. And you continue to do this over and over until you retire and somebody else steps in and, and does it for you. Okay, there you see some words and riz again. Um, we, we use the word risk assessment, but another way of putting that really is security vulnerability analysis. They're really uh, interchangeable terms. Security vulnerability analysis and risk assessment. You can be proactive or reactive. I would highly recommend you be proactive. But if you have it, at least do it afterwards. At least do it the next time. At least be reactive, but try to be proactive. Qualitative, quantitative, or both. And I'll, I'm going to go through that pretty quickly. Uh, I suggest when you get your slides that you look through that a little more carefully. I suggest you be both of those. Involve stakeholders and responders. This is a biggie. I want to spend a minute in here. If I were to go to a college or university and hire me to go there and do a risk assessment, and, they, and the president said, I want to pay you X amount of dollars, and I want you to do a risk assessment, all, all hazards risk assessment. And I said, OK. And I come back a month later, and, and I put down a document on that president's desk, and I say, here's your risk assessment. And he might, first of all, say, that was very quick. And then he or she might say, well, uh, none of my people said you talked to them. Well, I, I might respond and say, well, I didn't talk to anybody. I just went around, and I did it by myself. You haven't done a risk assessment if you've walked around and done it by yourself. There's no way I can know that college or university like who? Like the janitor? Like the security guards? Like the managers? 
like those responsible for physical plant or for deliveries or for maintenance or construction. So we need to involve the stakeholders. I remember years ago before 9-11, I was a first sergeant of the state police and I had to go out, all of us did, and we had to get stakeholders together for each one of our counties and we did a risk assessment. This is before 9-11 ever happened. Nobody even thought about it. And I had the fire chief in the room and the police chief and uh, transportation and four or five different people from the county. And we sat around a table the entire day and did a, uh, a, a portfolio for that city. Now, I'm going to tell you two other things. One thing that really bothered me was, and I'm not trying to cast stones or anything, when I was done, I already knew what my orders were. Orders were I couldn't share that information. So when I stood up to leave, guess what everybody asked me? Hey, can I get a copy of that? I already knew, but my answer had to be no. Well, what kind of a uh, stakeholder, what kind of a uh, uh, person am I? I won't even share the information to people who just gave it to me. Um, and that wasn't, that wasn't abnormal. That was an unusual thing before 9-11. After 9-11, guess what? We all started sharing information. Now, I, I say that to say we need to share information with our stakeholders, but if you get a FOIA request, a freedom of information request, or if you get other requests, for people to release information about your risk and mitigation uh, strategies, you're, you're able to, under law, uh, hopefully under law of your state, uh, be able to say, no, that's not available to you. In Virginia, we used to get uh, requests all the time for our tunnels and, and that sort of thing. We were able to say, no, you can't have that. Those are security issues. So even though we want to share with our stakeholders, we don't want to put out there to everybody what the risks are. We don't want to advertise that. Okay? So be proactive use both qualitative, quantitative, and involve your stakeholders. Get them involved. Another view of security vulnerability analysis. Uh, at the strategic level, we're going to look at the asset identification. We're going to do current security measures. We're going to see what's in place. Uh, we're going to do a threat assessment, a vulnerability assessment, a risk assessment. And then we go down here and we look at the cost-benefit analysis and we make our recommendations and report. But let's go back here for a second under current security measures. What kind of policies and procedures do you have in place? What kind of physical security do you have in place? What kind of security personnel do you have in place? I've seen this where you walk in, there's a security person sitting there, and then you come back out and they've got their friend sitting there. Security person. Look under threat assessment. All too often I see crime analysis being left out. Uh, crime is a big part of all of this, and, it, and people might go, well, that's a police thing. Well, it is, but it really isn't. It's everybody's thing. Uh, we need to know what the crime is like wherever this institution is or, or whatever it is we're looking at. Okay, seven steps to a security vulnerability analysis, basically aka risk assessment. Planning. Who's going to conduct this? Who's assisting? Is everyone cooperating? You need to have the right people around the table. Sometimes it's harder to do than other times. They have to be able to share information and be willing to share information, uh, and you, you probably have to meet more than once. Uh, asset and current environments identification. What is, it, what is around you? Uh, you might do an assessment on, on a university, and you might just look at university grounds. Well, right next door is an interstate. Right next door is a river. Well, that's, not, that's not on the ground, so I don't have to worry about it. Yes, you do. It's right next to you. What's, what's there can impact your university or your facility very easily. So sometimes we have to look beyond what's right in front of us. Threat identification, vulnerability identification, security countermeasures identification, recommendations and justifications, and again, there you see a security life cycle. We're going to cycle through this over and over again. Here's another way of looking at this, kind of a mind map. What is a hazard? Well. Probability of occurrence, resulting consequence, we've seen this. Severity of the consequence, level of exposure. So we look at all that, level of risk, is it acceptable? Now some people will say, no risk is acceptable. I will not accept any risk. That's just not, we can't deal with that. Remember we have to shut down and close the doors or we're going to do it that way. We have to accept some level of risk. So if it's no, then we have to look at this. Can the risk be reduced or eliminated? Okay, assessment, control. If it's yes, take action to reduce or eliminate the risk. If it's no, stop activity. On the other side, level of risk acceptable, yes. Then accept the risk, document it, and communicate it. Now, does that mean you won't get sued? This doesn't mean you won't get sued. It, it never means you won't get sued. At least you're able to defend yourself better. 
Very quickly, uh, risk decision making, like, and this is focused on terrorism, uh, likelihood is a probability that an adversary acquires, produces, and disseminates a weapon, ver and then consequences are the expected public health and economic impacts of an attack. Risk is a function of likelihood and consequences. Terrorism risk assessments are end-to-end, -end, integrating likelihood and consequences of terrorism events. Now, what you'll find a lot of times is the likelihood of a terrorist detonating a nuclear weapon is very small. It's not zero. It's very small. The consequences are very large. Okay? Now, let's reverse that. The likelihood of a terrorist detonating an IED really is pretty high. The consequences are not as high as if it was a nuclear weapon. So in some ways, they kind of level each other out. Here's another visual of, of, of the life cycle of critical infrastructure protection. There you see a, a identify key assets, asset value assessment, threat hazard assessment, risk screening, vulnerability assessment, risk analysis, upgrade countermeasures, reevaluate. And again, you'll get this, and you'll see it goes round and round, and it never stops. Very quickly, public versus private considerations. Remember, 85% of our infrastructure is privately owned. You have to look, what are the goals of your company? Well, usually it's to provide services to customers, either to sell them something or provide a service or, or something along those lines. We just don't exist to sit there and do nothing. Uh, we want to mitigate and prevent adverse incidents for all those reasons we talked about earlier. What's our response plan? Now, this is part of the mitigation and other parts of the uh, cycle of emergency management, but these are, are, are intertwined or should be intertwined into an risk assessment. Business recovery plan, do you have a coup plan, continuity of operations? Do you have redundancy built in? This helps you when you look at the risk assessment, are these things already there? Are we going to add them? Target hardening, now that's of course all by itself. Hot sites, in other words, is there a place where your data can go? For me, with my computer, it's as simple as having an off-site location where my computer goes down, my files are saved. Resiliency, all of these things are things you need to think about when you get over to the mitigation side of it. But when you're doing your risk assessment, you're asking yourself, do you have these things? Public consideration. Provide aid to return to normal operations and maybe a new normal. Uh, taking care of the wounded and, and, and those who have been displaced. And then provide operations. So there's a lot to it. Now here's the formula. And you'll see this written out. And I want to mention now that no matter, no matter what program you use, you're almost always going to be dealing with some level of subjectiv subjectivity. In other words, you're going to have to kind of guess a little bit. You have to give it a number. You're going to have to give it a word. Is it low, medium, or high? Or is it one, two, three, four, five? Um, you're going to have to kind of, with your brain trust you've gathered together, decide what is that number? What is that, what is that word you're going to use? So risk equals threat times vulnerability times consequence. Risk equals threat times vulnerability times consequence. And you're going to plug those numbers in, and like I said, they're always going to be somewhat subjective. Threat equals likelihood that a threat exists. And I'll give you an example. South Florida, the, the threat of a, of a or, or uh, the potential hazard of a blizzard is very low versus a, uh, a hurricane is extremely high. And in South Dakota, the chances of a hurricane are, are probably pretty low. Uh, vulnerability equals likelihood the target will be damaged. Okay? Well, if you're looking at South Florida, and it's nothing but marshland anyway, and if the rain comes over, there is some vulnerability, but how much is it really? Uh, now, this this go off the coast, and if you're looking at the oil rigs, uh, there's a lot of potential that if something happens there, the, the environment's going to be damaged. Uh, Consequence equals the magnitude of the attack's damage. And we'll look at that more as we go along. This is busy. I just want to explain it very quickly. Quantitative risk analysis, to sum it up, means it's mathematical. It means you plug numbers in, you have a numerical formula, and that's all you're doing, is you're plugging numbers in, and, and you're crunching those numbers, and you come up with a, a chart. Now, let me say that there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that by itself. But if that's all you do is come up with that chart, then 
I'm not sure the end user or the decision maker is going to get a lot out of that. You definitely want to have that. Now, qualitative is you're adding some verbiage to it. You're adding, you're adding more to it. Uh, you're, you're, you're explaining that chart, if you will. And I don't want to spend much time on those because you can get really deep into them. But you have quantitative and you have qualitative. And, and to me, the best way to deal with that is what I call mixed methodology. And, and research, we have quantitative, we have qualitative. And that's really what you're doing when you do a risk assessment, by the way, is doing research. It's to do a mixed methods. You, you bring those two together and, and you meld those together, and that's going to work the best. Both are capable of addressing the other limits, other's limitations more effectively than alone. You're, I think you're always much better when you do a mixed methods um, research. Now, very quickly here, uh, these are two important concepts, portfolio level versus asset level analysis. A portfolio level analysis is when you look at the big picture. For instance, you may be the town manager of a town of three square miles, 3,000 people. And you might want to uh, do an assessment of, uh, of, of your town. Now, private businesses, really, that's not something you would deal with, but maybe you want to look at that. Maybe you want to look at the critical infrastructures in your town, and there's plenty there to look at. So you might do a, I would suggest, highly recommend you do a portfolio level analysis. When I have my students do this, I have them pick an area that's manageable. I don't tell them, do, do all of New York City is too big. I'll tell them to pick a small little area. Uh, or, or a college or university or, or uh, something that's self-contained but has more than one building. And that's kind of what you're looking at. When it's a portfolio, it's more than one thing you're looking at. And now you look at it and you do your charts and you do your tables and now you come up, huh, the number one thing on my list, the most vulnerable, our biggest target is the theater in the center of the square. Well, that's where you go to asset analysis. Now you're looking at one place. You're looking at one individual place, okay? I suggest you always start off with portfolio and you work your way down to asset. It just depends on who's paying you and how you're doing this. They may tell you, our only focus is this one building. Then you can probably start off with asset level analysis. I would, I would argue you can still do portfolio with that building and then narrow it down to an asset within that building. And that's why I'm telling you earlier, you can, you can, you can take these and, and kind of create your own assessment. Worst case versus comprehensive risk assessment. Uh, some people would like to do a worst case. There's nothing wrong with that, except you're only going to be looking to see your threat is here. Now think about that. If you're in California and you do wildfires, that's a biggie. Is that the worst case? I don't know. Maybe mudslides are. Maybe drought is. Maybe earthquakes are. So you can see where it's kind of dangerous if you do worst case versus comprehensive. Now, I, I can argue for worst case. Because remember, we talked about persons, places, and things. If you were going to do a, a sporting event in your city, maybe it was going to be the Super Bowl. Maybe it was going to be a track race. Maybe it was some sort of concert. You might want to do a worst case analysis on that venue. What would happen if we were attacked uh, by, by, by a gun welding person? because you don't know if it's a terrorist or just a regular criminal. So there are times where you might do a worst case. I would suggest that you do a comprehensive risk assessment almost always, but there are occasions where worst case is perfectly fine. So we've got all this together, and we put our recommendations and justifications together, and we say threat plus vulnerability plus solution equals implementation. No, it really doesn't. Okay, In a perfect world, that would be the case. What it really is is threat plus vulnerability plus solution divided by budget equals implementation. See, we had to put together the threat, the vulnerability, and the solution, and then we had to figure out, okay, we have X amount of dollars, where is the best bang for the buck? So we look at the business impact analysis, we look at the cost-benefit assessment, and we look at the return on investment. I put return on investment on here because business-minded people always think about that. And honestly, you have a hard time putting a return on investment when you do this. The only place you might be able to do that right up front would be uh, lower your insurance cost. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, you may not get money back out of this, and that's why so many people don't want to put money into it. But you still have to do it anyway. We're going to switch gears in a minute here. But uh, I just wanted to mention cybersecurity vulnerability assessment. I mentioned that earlier. You might want to do that just as its own. I, and that's fine if you want to do that, but I would also suggest 
that you include uh, your cyber security when you do your risk assessment in general. I just want to make note of that. Okay, we're going to monitor with safeguards. We're going to make sure it's effective, it's relevant. We're going to make sure we update our, our mitigation strategies and we're ad adequately covering things. We're going to redesign outdated systems and we're going to test to make sure these things are right. So we, we've got it all, now we've got to make sure it's right. Real quickly, I'm only going to spend a couple minutes on this. I want to introduce you to a couple of different risk assessment uh, uh, programs or models out there. The first one, and this is going to be very quick, Terrorism Risk Assessment and Management, TRAM. This is, this is software you can do, and usually it's going to be done for, as you can tell, transportation systems. The next one is Biological Threat Risk Assessment, BTRA, and as you can guess, this is specifically geared toward biological threats. It's a very narrow focus. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, next one is Chemical Threat Risk Assessment. Again, very narrow focus for chemicals only. Um, integrated risk management framework. To me, me personally, this is my second favorite. Um, this one will cover a lot of things. This one is pretty generic, has a general structure, common language, and you can use this for, for pretty much any, any sort of risk assessment you want to. Um, the next one is Hazards US Multi-Hazard, uh, and these are for earthquakes and hurricanes, winds and floods and that sort of thing. My favorite, and I'm, I'm prejudiced here, is Carver plus Shock. This was, this was created back there in Vietnam. Special Forces used this. And I'll be honest with you, there are some people in the academic world who, who don't really care for this one as much, and I don't understand why. But this is, this is my favorite one here. It's very usable for pretty much anything you want. Um, I don't have time to get into these today because, like I said, it would take hours and hours. But uh, this is the one that I would prefer to use for pretty much any given situation. Maritime Security Risk Analysis Model, uh, again, you can tell us for maritime purposes, and that would make sense to use it for that one. I want to switch gears again just for a minute, and I want to show you a couple of slides that, uh, that, that you ought to consider when you do a risk assessment. First, make sure that you use GIS, Geographical, Geographical Information Systems. Now, on some places you may try to use them, you may not get to them because unless you have special access, uh, you can't uh, get them over certain places because of security reasons. But this is Mary Washington College. You know, college. I'm not sorry, we were Mary College in Williamsburg, Virginia. And that just kind of shows you the, uh, the layout of, of the, where the college is. Here's another picture. Uh, you, you can actually number this. And you can look here and you can see, look at all the facilities here. This is definitely, to me, something worthy of a portfolio. And there you see the stadium. Now, stadiums aren't occupied all the time, but when they are, when they are occupied, I would say they go to the top of the list, wouldn't you? Uh, so you can count. Uh, adding visuals to your risk assessments are very important. Here's another uh, uh, assessment of the uh, picture of the William & Mary. Uh, I think, uh, hopefully, you'll find this is beneficial to look at these sorts of things. Use GIS. You're going to gather a lot of... Uh, of uh, information, you want to know your population, you want to know the density, you want to know everything you can know about that area that you're looking at. Here's another one, Williamsburg, and then uh, what you'll see is the James River. Okay, uh, that's a pretty high hazard, isn't it? All right, here is a uh, a completed uh, a key asset prioritization matrix of William Mary's critical infrastructure. And this isn't exact, this isn't, this isn't uh, something I would put my hat on or, or put my seal of approval on, but it's a visual for you. And you can see at the top, there's a, uh, there's a structure, and down on the left-hand side, you see the structures they looked at. They didn't put every single solitary structure on there. Uh, and then across to the right, you'll see occupant exposure, economic impact, business or service interrupted, interdependencies, and then the total. And you might be wondering, where does that total come from? And there's a formula for that. But you can see Sadler Center ended up being top, along with uh, Swim Library, and then and it goes on down the list there. Okay, at the bottom you'll see Sunken Gardens. There's probably an area where people gather. And here you see another uh, diagram of this, where a key asset screening assessment for Sadler Center, the structure, people, utilities, and network across the uh, left hand side, and across the top you see casualties environmental impact, economic, business, infrastructure, and then the weighted total. 
and then you'll see uh, scoring criteria for impact factors. And uh, there's a lot here. We don't have a lot of time to spend on it. But this is how you would score. If you look at number one, environmental impact will not leave the key assets property versus if you go to four, likely to leave the key assets property. And you can see this is kind of giving you something to operate off of, so you don't have to guess at it so much. But you still have to decide which one of these numbers to pick. And there you see the, uh, the uh, weighted, weighting scale for each one. And there you see another uh, diagram of, uh, you see problem, fire, active shooter, severe weather, explosive, and you see the risk, existing countermeasures, and recommendations, and a priority. Hopefully this kind of helps you visualize, if you haven't done one of these, it helps you visualize it. And there's computer programs that will help you do all of this, quite frankly. Okay, what comes next? The final part of the assessment are actually recommendations involving risk, risk security countermeasures and on mitigation strategies. Mitigation occurs in two forms. Mitigation will always occur in two forms. It's either going to be structural or it's going to be non-structural. Remember what I said in the very beginning. We don't want to do mitigation strategies until we do a risk assessment. It doesn't make sense to do mitigation strategies until we do the risk assessment. Then they're going to be structural or they're going to be non-structural. And there's so many different things that fall into both these categories. I just gave you a couple. Structural or physical systems or physical things. Harden the key asset. Passive measures, doors, windows, fences, active measures, barriers, locks, and alarms, maybe stormproof glass, uh, maybe enhanced concrete, more rebar. There's all sorts of things that are structural. If you go to the beach, now houses are having to be raised up on pillars. Those are all structural. Non-structural are administrative things, policies and procedures, background checks, access control, vehicle search procedures, building codes, and zoning. So after we've done our assessment, we've picked our targets, we've picked, we're going to do this building, that building, and that building, and these are the things we're going to do to them. Okay, as I mentioned before, not all risk can be eliminated. A thorough, timely risk assessment, security vulnerability analysis can prevent and mitigate substantially on the risk we face. There's a lot of checklists out there, there's tips online, there's places you can go, there's programs you can buy. FEMA has a lot of great material that you can get. There's experts out there who can help you with this at, at the federal and state level, and there are some private ones. Uh, some of the engineering firms will do this. Now, you've got to be careful because certain people, I, I consider myself a generalist, and I look at all of it. Uh, certain people are going to focus on sort of cyber. If you go to a structural engineer, they're going to focus on structure. And, there, and like I said, there's a lot of other things. There's so much to get into here. OSHA, uh, the kitchens and, and your buildings, there's so many different variables. There, it's, it's just a massive number of things we have to look at when we look at risk. The worst time to assess risk, uh, the vulnerability of an asset is after its destruction. If you have to, do it then, but we're better to do it before it happens. Uh, it's, it's, our, it's our duty, really, to our people who work for us and with us that we, that we protect them and we help them. And, uh, and actually, if it's the bad guys, we want to stop them. Now, here's the bad thing about it. When you look at crime prevention, uh, the problem you will have is it's called disbursement uh, or dispersion. If you make a target hardened, and if I put a light up around my house and say, my house is protected by Smith & Wesson, I have guard dogs, People probably aren't going to bother my house. They might go to my neighbor who has trees all around his house and shrubs and, and doesn't have anything to show that his house is protected. So uh, the bad guys may go someplace else. But we're dealing with more than just bad guys. We're dealing with all hazards. Um, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. I hope you found some nuggets, some things to take with you, some maybe some new things. I know a lot of you probably already have done this and you've heard these things. Hopefully you've got some something new here, something that, that you can share. If you have questions or comments, uh, anything I can help you with, i would be glad to. There's my contact information. And uh, Aaron, uh, I'd like to take any questions anybody has. If I can't answer your question, I'll tell you I can't, and I will try to find you the answer. It's been a pleasure, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Aaron. All right, Dr. Jeff, thanks so much for your time. And uh, everyone, uh, you can enter any questions that you have for Dr. Jeff through the GoToWebinar toolbar, and we will try to get through as many as possible. Uh, we do have a couple of, uh, of great questions here. The first one is regarding cybersecurity threat assessment. 
is it possible for a non-technical person to effectively conduct the cybersecurity threat assessment? That's a really good question. I would say yes and no uh, to, a, to a certain degree because you have to remember what's the end result. We're looking at structural and non-structural mitigation strategies. And, and uh, once you get to a certain level, you probably want to have an expert who can do that for you. But if you're talking about policies and procedures, if you're talking about making sure you keep your passwords up to date, making sure you don't share, share that, uh, making sure you do good backgrounds, maybe you actually have an access to your employees' computers. Uh, so I would say up to up to degree, degree yes. And uh, if you don't want to spend the money on it, definitely do it, your, do it through your own people. And even if it's not the cyber expert. Now, I will also say, um, if it's certain things, then you ought to, and you better bring the right people in. If you're dealing with classified information, national security information, you don't want to leave it to a non-expert. You want you want the right people to come in there who can help, and that may be a time where you do an individual cybersecurity assessment. So the answer is yes and no. It depends on, on the level of the degree you're, that you need to do it and the money you have to do it. Um, but a, a, I could not step in there and go much beyond a, a normal protocol review and, and get into firewalls and that sort of thing. So I hope that gives you an answer. Great. Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, are you able to refer us to additional information regarding personal protection, specifically uh, protecting personal representatives during campaigns? Ah, you know, um, I did not, I don't have anything, uh, in my references you may find some things like that. Um, you know, I looked at that, and as you can see, we had so much to cover, I, I couldn't get into that. That really is, is another class, and uh, there, there's a lot there to look at. And one thing I didn't mention, because uh, I did say in the beginning, persons, places, and things, the persons one is almost, it is a separate entity. And, and you can do that uh, from two ways, intuitively, uh, deductively, or, or inductively. And I, I, I say it this way, what you're seeing in a lot of schools now and I, I'm really leery of this, is uh, are, are schools looking at kids, are, are they a threat? And, and it's so hard to predict, predict human nature, you know. We're trying to ward kids off from uh, from getting to that point where they're going to start shooting people. So when you look at people, you, you can look at the target or you can look at the, the potential offender. Uh, and you can do it both ways, and I would suggest you do it both ways as much as you can. Uh, uh, Israel does a great job with uh, behavioral profiling um, and we don't seem to want to do that too much, we, a little bit, but uh, that's, I don't have anything in my reference material for that, I don't believe. Okay. Um, no, that's I not looking at. understand. Um, we've got a yeah. bunch of questions coming in, and, and hopefully we'll get through them all here. Um, do you have suggestions to get buy-in from senior leaders within the private industry to conduct risk assessments? Boy, that's a, that is a million dollar question. And I kind of hit on it a lot as I went along. Um, one way to do it is, if, what's in it for me? Uh, first, if you can show them that maybe you'll save a little bit of money on insurance, but if you can show them examples and cases of where things weren't done right, and they are out there, where, where it was ignored or they knew about it and didn't deal with it and how much it's going to cost them, if you can show them the economic impact, that's going to go a long ways. But if you go down through my list of things about the, 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 the ethical reasons and the moral reasons and the safety and the security reasons, it's a hard sell. And you kind of have to know who you're dealing with. And, and, and you're exactly right. If you don't get buy-in from them, it's almost impossible to do down the channel. Um, there isn't any one answer to that. You have to look at, look at the person you're dealing with. You have to find a champion. Uh, and you just got to figure out how to get to them on that. Maybe you have somebody in your agency, that's their, that's their job. They're, they're the risk assessment person. Uh, a lot of colleges and universities now have people who are doing that. I will tell you, we're better off than we were 10 years ago, and we're better off than we were 20 years ago, but there's still that uh, cost-benefit analysis and return on investment. And there really isn't much of a return on investment other than pay me now or pay me later. Um, you have to look at all those things. You just got to convince them. And I would suggest you look at that list and come up with a good strategy because you may only have one shot at it. Great. Uh, we've had a, a lot of questions come in regarding involving stakeholders, and I'm going to try to try to consolidate those questions. And so uh, 
what are what are some of the different approaches that you'd recommend for getting input from stakeholders? Are you talking about one-on-one -on -one interviews, group interviews, uh, questionnaires that you might send out to the hospital staff? Yeah, and that, great, wonderful question. Uh, all of the above, you have to come up with a strategy. One thing you don't want to do is you don't want to waste anybody's time. I used to uh, hate it when I would go to a meeting and then I would be given a, a, a book or whatever and asked to comment on it and I haven't even seen it yet. So what you want to do to begin with is lay the fertile ground for that. You want to get the right people around the table. This means you may have to go up a little bit higher up the food chain to get their bosses. Uh, you, if you have one or two people missing who are key players, that's a problem. So you may have to, and you'll probably have to have more than one meeting. Uh, you don't want to waste your time. You want to make good use of the time. You can do a survey. That's perfectly fine. You can do a, 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 a survey monkey survey. There's all sorts of surveys you can use. You can do a paper survey. You can do telephone conferences. You can meet around the circle. I like the idea of meeting people face-to-face, -face, doing a little presentation first, letting them know who you are, what you're there for, and that they're, that they're stakeholders. You value their time and their information, and they're all equal parts of the team. Uh, it's really, you know, just like with planning, a lot of it, a lot of it is getting to know the people, getting to know who's there, and, and you got to make sure you don't leave people out because, uh, and don't think, don't ever think somebody's too low down the totem pole to be worthy of information. I've seen that happen, and that's a terrible thing to do. Great. Thank you. Really all of the above. Mm -hmm. Kind of associate, associated with the last couple of questions, I'm guessing, but uh, uh, and I'll just read verbatim. I recently had a client deny our opportunity to send a questionnaire uh, out to the hospital staff. Um, we had to do our assessment essentially in a vacuum without hearing from the floors. How does that affect the entire document? Well, it really weakens it. I mean, uh, uh, unless you have all sorts of time to go around and do all that footwork, um, it's going to weaken it. But even if you can, it's, it's just almost impossible to replace that knowledge that people have who are there working day in and day out on those wards and wings. And, and the hospital is a very unique place. There are so many hazards in the hospital. And I'm speaking to the choir, but whoever asked that question, uh, you, you just need to have the right people around that table. If you can't, maybe there's somebody else who's close enough to that. Um, and, and that may be something you had to give a caveat to at the end. Uh, and that's why if you go to the top, if you get the top people's buy-in, and everybody knows that in the beginning, you probably won't have as much of that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be weakened because you don't have that right information. And, and another thing is you might want to, if you tell them what's in it for them, you know, we're, we're looking out for you. We're trying to help you. Uh, this is about making things better. And uh, we, we, I value your input. So, so my occasions that, that human skill and, and uh, really collaboration and cooperation. Great. But it's not going to be as complete if you have people missing. Sure. Uh, we have time for just uh, just a couple more questions. And uh, in fact, talking about collaboration, a uh, really great question. Uh, are the risk assessment, are the personnel involved in risk, as, risk as assessment the same personnel that are involved in mitigating the risk? Oh, that's great. Maybe, maybe not. Um, it, it may be, um, if, it's, if it's a policy or procedure thing, it may very well be. If it's a structural thing, it's, it's very likely you're going to have to get outside contractors to come in and, and uh, put these things in place. And maybe it's going to come out of their budget. Uh, maybe it's going to come out of somebody else's budget. Um, so it, it could be. There's a very good likelihood, but there's no guarantee that they'll be the same people. It just kind of just depends on the area, depends on the size of the agency. Uh, it could be more likely if, if it's a uh, non if it's a non structural issue, but if it's a structural issue, like I said, there's there's a lot of things that I, I can't imagine a lot of people could do who are doing those jobs like rewiring a building or putting a wall in or putting gates in or all those things. So um, it, it's it's fifty fifty probably on that. Great. I uh, I have to kind of laugh at this last question because it's it's I think a, a one that a lot of people are going to. Um, sympathize with. Uh, in my organization, the position of risk manager is oftentimes just another hat that needs to be a worn. Uh, is there a recommended minimum frequency for updating an assessment? Oh, wonderful question. I have never seen one written down. 
You know, uh, I just I'm going through my head trying to trying to visualize if I've ever seen one written down. And I'll I'll say this: uh, you're exactly right. You can tell um, a lot about the weight and the significance and the importance of a emergency manager or a player in that field by where the agency places that person. In other words, if it's a sheriff's office and they give it to the part-time deputy who works eight hours a month, you can tell the importance that sheriff's office gives that position versus is that's a captain within the agency, you know what I mean? So you, you can tell a lot by that, but um, me, myself, I would say at least once a year. Now, once you've done it right and you've done it good, uh, I'm not saying you should just dust it off and, and go through it quickly, but it doesn't have to be quite as comprehensive if you go every other year, every three years. You go into five years, now you're starting to push an awful lot. Things have changed an awful lot. I'll give you an example. With, with my students, um, a couple of years ago, I wasn't talking about social media or cybersecurity, and now uh, I had to talk about that an awful lot because it is so, it's so, such a pressing thing in everything we do. And I can't overemphasize how much cyber plays into all of this. The last thing on that is um, if, you, uh, uh, if, if you're in that position, do the best you can with it. You know, make the best of it. Uh, and and it's, it's, it depends on the size of your agency. It depends on how big it is. If you have a large metropolitan hospital and uh, and you're the only person that does that, you, you know, you're not going to get around to that but so often. And again, everybody else has other jobs to do and you're asking them to come around for these meetings. You know, if you do it every three months, that's not a good idea. Every six months, probably not necessary. Once a year in bed, I wouldn't do it much more than that. Uh, every year, every other year in bed, you get to five years, it's a little much. Great. Dr. Jeff, thank you so much for all the time. Thank you for uh, the folks that attended our webinar. Um, that is all the time that we have for today. Once again, we'll be putting this presentation, the recording, on the Justice Clearinghouse website. And I thank you, and please, everyone, stay safe. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.